The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Otto, here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Paul, how are you doing tonight? Matt, I'm so good. I'm stoked for the topic. How are you? I'm doing well. And Paul, tonight, this is a great topic. We're talking about hypoxemia, hypoxemia. I don't know how to pronounce it, Paul. But we have with us the great Dr. Nick Mark, who he's been on the show in the past. Uh, and I'm sure the audience is aware of him and are big fans. But if not, they're, they're in for a treat. Um, Paul, before we tell them more about him and introduce our co-host and producer for this episode, can you remind people, what is it that we do on the Curbsiders? I am so thrilled to do so. I feel like we haven't recorded together for forever, so this is this is a real treat. We are the Internal Medicine Podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. As you alluded to, we are joined by the great um, Dr. Cyrus Askin, pulmonologist extraordinaire. Cyrus, how are you? I'm good, Paul. How are you? I'm terrific. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Why don't we give you this chance to tell us about who we talked to and what we talked about? Awesome. Uh, glad to do it. So um, we do have a fantastic ex- episode lined up for y'all today. Uh, so so Dr. Nick Mark is a pulmonary and critical care physician, medical educator in Seattle, Washington. He received his bachelor's of science from Brown University and a medical degree from New York University School of Medicine. He then went on to complete internal medicine residency and fellowships in pulmonary and critical care medicine at the University of Washington. He's currently an an attending intensivist, i.e. an ICU doctor, uh, at Swedish Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. He's also somewhat famous on the Twitterverse for the OnePagerICU.com, which is a a fantastic resource. It's a website dedicated to providing concise summaries of of physiology and critical care topics. And so really uh, today he he chatted with us for, for a good while about kind of a differential for hypoxemia, how to approach it. And, and ways we can sort of understand it better from soup to nuts. So really, without further ado, let's get to it. Hey, Paul, did you know that oxygen and magnesium are dating? Tell me more. Well, if you look up the chemical symbols, Paul, OMG. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing more at the shame oh, on your no. face than I'm at the joke. <laughs> Thank you to uh, oxygenpunstoppable.com pun, for those fantastic oxygen puns. And, uh, you know, uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep them coming, audience. Punception. Nick, thank you for uh, struggling with us through uh, some technical difficulties. Uh, as I was mentioning to Paul, I haven't recorded in a while. <laughs> Paul's, Paul's been recording his face off the past two weeks, but I've, I've taken a little break. Uh, so uh, a little rusty. Nick, thank you for joining us again. Uh, the audience may remember you from a COVID episode that we did way back early on uh, in, in the pandemic. And uh, thank you for coming back. Can you tell the audience... In case they didn't catch that one, can you remind them, give them a one-liner about yourself and some hobby or interest outside of medicine? Sure. So I'm an ICU doc, a dad, physiology nerd. I love animal physiology and human physiology. I think animals can teach us a lot about us. Uh, When I'm not working, I love tinkering with stuff, building stuff in the garage. Most recent project was building a little lending library with kids on the street. And you got to tell the audience, like... uh, True or false, there may be solar panels on this thing? <laughs> yes. So this is the Pacific Northwest. Everything's got to be green. So it's got a little LED light inside and a solar panel on the roof. Um, charges up during the day, lights up the books at night. Just in case I anyone's like creeping on your property to take your, your books in the middle of the <laughs> no, night. No, it's, it's to make it easier to creep on my property to take books. That's the goal. <laughs> So, so if, if anyone happens to live in the Pacific Northwest, Nick is encouraging you to uh, trespass on his property and take some books from his lending library. Sure, we'll, Take a book, leave a book. We'll link the address in the go. show notes. No problem. That sounds good. <laughs> um, <laughs> speaking of books, it's everything seems horrible. And this is my transition to asking you for some way to distract myself. So can you give me some piece of pop culture, book, movie, TV show, album, doesn't really matter. What have you been doing to kind of take your mind off of the world recently? Well, I just watched uh, the last season of Stranger Things, but I I don't know that that's like the uplifting (laughs) thing you're looking for. Yep. Nope. Um, Just reread an old favorite, uh, Sherlock Holmes. 
And I just love those stories. You know, it's, it's interesting, like the sort of faux autobiographical style, like they're just, they're just fun. I don't know. It's a nice, like whenever I'm commuting, it's nice to have like a 20 or 30 minute short story to listen to. Completely agree with that. I, I read them a couple, maybe two, three years ago. I read and, and they're, they, yeah, they hold up. They're, they are a good read. Cyrus, anything you wanted to ask Nick as we, as we have him here, he's at your mercy. Oh my goodness. Sure. Um, you know, I always, um, I'm always interested in advice or feedback that our guests have received. So Nick, any advice or any feedback you've received during your training or during your career thus far that you've really taken to heart? Yeah, uh, I can boil it down for to just six words. Say no, quit stuff, fail fast. Um, it's very easy to get overloaded with things that you said yes to that you didn't really want to do. It's really easy to get sucked into stuff that doesn't bring you joy and doesn't help you professionally. Um, and it's also easy to get stuck doing stuff that you're bad at. Um, so say no, quit stuff, fail fast. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, especially the quitting stuff. I, I think that uh, things tend to build up, you know, because like when you when you first finish your training, people are like, oh, we have a new a new person, they're young and eager and they just start loading stuff onto you. And so handing things off to other young and eager people, uh, or, or they don't have to be young, just other people is a good <laughs> thing to do, I think. So, well, we have a, yeah, avoid, have, avoid recurring meetings at all costs. <laughs> yes. One-offs are much better Tremendous than advice. This episode is brought to you by Indeed. And audience, we are big fans of Indeed here at The Curbsiders because it is the hiring platform that lets you attract, interview, and hire applicants all in one place. And we've had experience with the platform because a while back, we needed some people to help out with the show and we posted on Indeed and we got such a great response a ton of great candidates, and we were able to organize, sort through them right there on Indeed's platform, set up the interviews. You can even do the interviews on the platform. Indeed is going to save you time. It's the one powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. So start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash internal medicine. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at indeed.com slash internal medicine. Indeed.com slash internal medicine. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. An audience, you know BetterHelp has been a sponsor of ours for a long time, and that's because we think that getting yourself into therapy to get the care you need is important, and BetterHelp is great because it really helps you get into therapy. It makes it easy. All you have to do is go online, choose a therapist, and they can match you within 48 hours, and bam, there you are, you're in therapy, so there's no excuses anymore. And as we've talked about on the show, we think it's very important to take care of yourself so you can take care of your patients. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat only therapy sessions so you don't even have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to, and it can be more affordable than inpatient therapy. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Curb. That's Better, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Curb. BetterHelp.com slash Curb. Well, we have a ton to get to tonight, so maybe uh, maybe we should get to the script. Unless, Cyrus, did you have a pick of the week that you just had to get out there? Or you want to you wanna get to this first case? Let's get to the case. Ms. Wilson is a 60-year-old female admitted for sepsis from a urinary source. She has a past medical history of asthma COPD overlap, complicated by bronchiectasis, heart failure with borderline ejection fraction, and class 3 obesity. Per report, Ms. Wilson has been fairly stable after starting empiric broad-spectrum antibiotic therapy. You are the overnight cross-covering clinician enjoying a quiet night when you get a text page from the patient's nurse stating that her pulse oximeter is reading saturations in the mid-80s. So before getting into the case and all the nitty gritty, I think it might be helpful to review some of the uh, basic definitions and kind of shore up our understanding of of oxygen delivery via some key concepts. Um, so um, perhaps we can pretend that we've got a long walk to this RRT. 
Um, and maybe there are some definitions, Nick, that you could work through with us, starting with things like hypoxemia or hypoxia, and then, you know, sort of take the ball and run with it. Yeah, that's that sounds great. So we're walking to this RRT. We have a minute or two. So what is hypoxemia? Hypoxemia is low oxygen in the blood. This is the thing that we measure with a pulse ox or with a blood gas. That's different from hypoxia, which is the state of having low oxygen at the level of the tissues, the cells that are actually using them. It's kind of the difference between what's easy to measure and what actually matters. And it turns out there are ways that you can be uh, hypoxic without being hypoxemic. So it's actually an important difference. Usually when we're saying it, we mean hypoxemia because what we're saying is somebody desaturated or you got a blood gas and the number was low. So usually we mean hypoxemia. And jumping off from there, I think it's useful. You mentioned the blood gas. You mentioned the pulse oximeter. What are they measuring? Is it important for us to know the difference between the two? Yeah, that's a, that's a crucial distinction. So um, let's back up just a little bit and talk about a few other terms. So we, we need to introduce something called oxygen content, which is how much oxygen is there in the blood. And this really depends on just two things. What is your saturation, which you can measure either by blood gas or by a pulse ox? And what is your hemoglobin? Because 99% of the oxygen in your blood is carried on your hemoglobin. So sometimes we forget that somebody who has a hemoglobin of five, even with a SAT of 100, their blood is carrying half as much oxygen as somebody with uh, a normal hemoglobin of 10. So that's one really key thing to remember. Another concept we should introduce is the idea of oxygen delivery. And this is how much oxygen is actually going to the tissues. And that's really simple. That's just your oxygen content times your cardiac output. How much oxygen is in the blood and how much blood are you pumping per minute? The reason why this is important is because if you imagine somebody who has a low cardiac output and who's anemic, their ability to deliver oxygen is going to be severely impaired. So the saturation tells you one piece of it, but you have to put it in the context of how is their cardiac output? And how is their ability to carry oxygen on hemoglobin? I'm so, I'm sorry, I have to I can't help myself here. It's like you know how I know you're an ICU doctor because a hemoglobin of ten is normal. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes, you've added me. I actually get suspicious when I see a normal he- hemoglobin as an internist because so many of our patients, I, f- I feel like ten plus or minus two is a normal hemoglobin <laughs> fair, for fair for enough, my yeah. patients. In the ICU, it's probably even more severe than that, but it's just, yeah, that's an astute point, Cyrus. I I like it. 13. Do they smoke? (laughs) (laughs) No, testosterone. It's the testosterone. (laughs) Oh, gosh. All right. Oh, man. Such such fun, Paul. So uh, let's let's get into this a little bit. So the the question, uh, we took that diversion. The question was pulse oximetry versus blood gas. What are, what are the, what are they measuring now that we've laid out some of the, uh, some of the terms here? So um, we could probably get a little bit more into the weeds on both of them in a minute, but what a pulse ox is measuring is a pulse ox is shining light through your skin and measuring the absorption of hemoglobin. And if you think about it, Our eyes are actually pulse oximeters. When you look at somebody and you see cyanosis, what you're seeing is the fact that hemoglobin is a different color when it's deoxygenated and when it's oxygenated. What a pulse ox is, is it's just a much more sensitive version of your eyes. In order to see cyanosis, you need to have about five grams per deciliter of deoxygenated hemoglobin. That's a lot, right? If your hemoglobin's 10, that means your SAT's 50%. Um, That's also why a lot of people can be hypoxemic without being cyanotic. What a pulse ox is, is it's just shining a red light and an infrared light through your skin and measuring what the saturation of hemoglobin is. And there are some big limitations to that, which we can talk about. What a blood gas is, is a blood gas is you're taking a sample from an artery or a vein, and then you're putting it in a machine, which is actually measuring the amount of dissolved oxygen. So this is very different. This is, this is a direct measurement. And it's measuring the P little a O2 or the partial pressure of oxygen in an artery. Yeah. As opposed to the, the P big a O2, which is in the alveolus. Exactly. And that's where the, the big a and the little a come together. And that's where we get the AA gradient or AA difference, which we'll talk about. Yeah. And that, that's going to be key when we're talking, talking about our differential here. I don't know, Paul, what do you, do you think this is now is a time to mention? I mean, we, we, we're talking about pulse oximetry. It's made the news a lot now, Paul. Do you think we should talk about that now? I or, think now's or the time. That for later? Yeah. I, you know, yeah. it's rather than sort of 
keep the audience suspense. Why don't we talk a little bit about the limitations of pulse oximetry? Because it's it's come up a lot recently, I think. Yeah, because Nick, you're talking about shining light through through the skin. So uh, there's been a lot of uh, there's been a lot of this in the news lately, talking about pulse oximeter underestimating or overestimating. Um, can you can you remind us uh, what yeah what's so going the on? The pulse there? ox was developed back in like the 1940s. Initially, they used it on like high altitude pilots to see if they were hypoxic. It turned it into a clinical tool in the 70s, 80s, and then it really became mainstream. Now it's something that you can buy on Amazon for $20. But there were a couple problems with the way they developed it. They Basically, what they needed to do is they needed to turn absorption of light into a number. So they took healthy volunteers who consented to have an arterial line placed, and they had them breathe lower concentrations of oxygen. So they dropped their sats. And then they measured blood gases at different points, and they measured the absorption of those two wavelengths of light at different points. And they used this to construct kind of a standard curve where they could say this level of absorption, this ratio of these two lights equals a sat of 80. And that's how they developed the algorithm. But there was a problem. Well, the two problems. One, they didn't kill their volunteers. Um, That's discouraged. And so we don't have good data on sats less than 70%. So a pulse ox is inherently very inaccurate at those low numbers. So whenever I hear a sat of 30, I just think, okay, that means the, it means low. It's not precise. It's not accurate. It just means low. The other crucial limitation was they used all Caucasian volunteers for this study. And it turns out that having pigment in your skin also affects the transmission and absorption of light. And importantly, just, just two years ago now, there was a big study published in the New England Journal where they looked at people who had had pulse ox measurements and blood gas measurements at the same time. And they found that in the black patients in that cohort, there was a bigger difference. Um, And even more concerningly, the pulse ox tended to overestimate their true oxygen saturation by about 3%. This actually doesn't sound like much, but that's a really big deal. Because if you think about it, 3% could be the difference between somebody qualifying for home oxygen or not. It could be the difference between somebody getting admitted to the hospital from the emergency room or not. And in the setting of COVID, it could be the difference between treating somebody with steroids or not. And all of those could have really big differences. So that um, systematic bias in measurement actually probably leads to real disparities in the healthcare that, that Black people receive because this tool that we use every day was developed in a, in a not diverse cohort. And so how would you recommend we handle, handle this clinically? Um, Cause I, I know that there are groups trying to work on making a pulse oximeter that will account for this so that we can get, no matter what the skin color is, we should be able to get correct measurements or more accurate measurements. But how should we handle that for the time being, knowing that our technology has this inherent you know, bias or flaw built into it. Right. So absolutely. So big picture, we should insist that medical devices get developed with a diverse cohort. So we don't get into this situation again. Um, Immediate picture. We should remember that the pulse ox is precise, but not always accurate. And it's especially inaccurate in some groups like people with darker skin. Um, It's also inaccurate in people whose extremities are cold in people who have abnormal hemoglobin, like net hemoglobin, um, or carboxyhemoglobin, um, even glycohemoglobin can affect the accuracy. Um, so people with a high A1C can be off by an extra one or two percent. So I think the key is just remember that this number is not perfectly precise. And if you are going to make a completely different decision based on one or two points, you should remember to look back and see the patient as a whole and look at their clinical status. Yeah. So that, that might include getting a blood gas at that time. If it's, you know, if it's the difference between getting a therapy and not getting a therapy. Um, exactly. Yeah. Paul, anything, anything we're missing or Cyrus, anything we're missing from this discussion, uh, before we move on with our case here? I thought that was outstanding. I actually hadn't heard the derivation of the pulse oximeter before as a board certified pulmonologist. So it's somewhat embarrassing to admit that, but it's, (laughs) it's actually fascinating. And now I understand uh, exactly why we can't trust those those really low readings it makes perfect sense. Yeah, well, and and there's actually there's another great pearl there we should talk about, which is the cyanosis occurs with five grams of deoxygenated hemoglobin. So often, what you'll see is you'll see somebody who's polycythemic, and 
cyanotic, right? And what you're seeing there is maybe they've increased their hemoglobin to 15 and their SAT is like 75. That means that they have about five grams of deoxygenated hemoglobin. That means that we can see it with our eyes. But in somebody who has, you know, a lower hemoglobin, they just won't have enough to be able to see it if you look at their nails or lips or whatever. So cyanosis is useful, but it's it's not something we see every day because you have to get you have to get your deoxygenated hemoglobin to a very high number. Well, we should I think we should get back to our patient here. So we're we're finally getting to the bedside now and we've we've sort of as we were walking there together, you refreshed us on some of these terms, taught us some cool stuff. Once we actually get in the room, because this is a, you know, this series is about rapid response, like in the patient who has hypoxemia. So what are we going to do as soon as we get in the room? So I think the, the key first question that you should try to answer in the first few seconds, first 30 seconds, is sick, not sick. And there's a couple of things that we can look at that will help us figure that out. Uh, first of all, you know, what is Miss Wilson's work of breathing? Is she using accessory muscles? Is she breathing really fast? Um, The reason why this is concerning is because somebody who is desaturating and has a high work of breathing is probably going to tire out and then they're going to desaturate even more. It suggests that their current state is not stable. It's going to get worse. Another key question is, is she protecting her airway? So maybe her work of breathing isn't elevated, but she's like minimally responsive or unresponsive. That's a very worrisome situation as well. Somebody who's hypoxemic and unresponsive um, may need may need airway management. And Nick, can we pause here for a second? And I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but I just feel like this is a point that I struggled with a million years ago when I was responsible for inpatients. Is I would hear protecting their airway all the time and not have any idea what that means. Like it's you know I I don't know if people were sticking their fingers down their throat or if it just meant the patient wasn't <laughs> actively throwing up. Like I just it seemed ill defined and a reason to not consider intubation if someone was quote unquote protecting their airway. So is there, is there a good way to define that or assess that before we sort of move on to your next point? Uh, to be a little bit crass, it's like the Supreme Court's definition of <laughs> pornography. Yeah. You know it when you see it. Sure. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that can sort of fit into not protecting your airway. It could be that you are just deeply unconscious. And so, you know, if you were to have an aspiration event, you clearly couldn't do anything about it. So like somebody who's unresponsive to pain is probably not protecting their airway. Um, it could also be somebody where they're clearly not protecting their airway because you can see that happening. You can see that they're vomiting. They have a bad nosebleed. They have something else. And you can see that um, vomit, blood, fluid is pooling in their airways. So it could be that too. And, and actually another thing that's useful is like, Sometimes, you know, suctioning is another thing you'll see. So somebody who's being suctioned really frequently and they're not clearing secretions, that can be another clue that they're not really protecting their airway. Yeah, I've heard the phrase not responding, but protecting their airway. And I'm like, I don't understand what that means or how that can possibly be. But it sounds like that maybe is not a thing. I mean, I guess that, you know, one one way you often can see that is like somebody who's not conversant with you. They're not waking up to stimulus. But, you know, if you suction them, they have a gag reflex. You know, maybe they push you away a little bit, or maybe it's just clear that they, 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 they do have some airway reflexes intact. So it is possible, but when you see somebody who's hypoxic and unresponsive, that's a worrisome situation. (laughs) Yes. Agreed. That should be a rapid response. And and I think even in that situation you were describing, like, uh, you know, if the person's not responsive, uh, to anything but gag, it's, uh, or like from suction, it's definitely not giving me the warm and fuzzies. (laughs) No. (laughs) And that, you know, unless this is a situation that's quickly reversible, let's say with Narcan, this is probably somebody who is not safe to stay on the floor if they're in this state. So, you know, sometimes, you know, the the line from House of God, dispo comes first. But when you go to a rapid response, sometimes dispo comes first. And the key question is, is this person going to stay in this room or go to a higher level of care, like step down or ICU? And sometimes in the first 10 seconds, you can pretty much answer that question. Yeah, so I think with the patient we're giving you here, Miss Wilson, we'll say she she is awake. She's not, you know, she doesn't have pulled secretions, not bleeding, vomiting profusely, and not clearing it. So th- this is this is a patient who we haven't said sick or not sick for sure yet, but we we'll say she's protecting her airway. Um, she's not. She's not very sick. Uh, so next couple of questions: um, How hypoxemic is she? There's a big difference between a SAD of eighty-eight percent and sixty-eight percent. So the magnitude of her hypoxia matters. 
And then does she have signs of inadequate oxygen delivery? And we'll get to what these are later, but things like altered mental status, chest pain, lactate elevation, things that make it clear that um, that not only is there hypoxemia, low oxygen in the blood, but there's also evidence of hypoxia. Her tissues are not getting enough oxygen. That's a worrisome sign as well. And then finally, I think maybe probably the biggest one that you can assess pretty quickly is say hi to her. And how does she respond? If she's awake and she you know, ha- she can have a full sentence conversation with you. That's a very different category than somebody who has one or two word dyspnea. Cyrus, do we want to put a label on that yet for this patient? Uh, what is what's happening with Miss Wilson as far as how you know how how we have her feeling here? Yeah, so I think you know Miss Wilson. Uh, she does look like she's working a little bit harder to breathe. She is answering your questions, but um, in you know three to four, maybe five sentence answers rather than kind of full sentences. Um, and, and so while she doesn't look like she is, uh, you know, this is an impending respiratory failure, she certainly looks like someone for whom intervention of some sort is warranted and further workup is necessary. Right. So this is, this is not somebody where we're going to leave. This is somebody where we're going to slow down a little bit and put on our internal medicine thinking caps and try to figure out what's going wrong. You know, sometimes when somebody's really sick, you're not really thinking about what the cause is. You're really just treating it emergently and then you'll figure it out. This is a situation where we can flip the order. So while, you know, of course, when you go to a rapid response, usually uh, in the old days, you would have the paper chart, at, you know, at the edge of the bed with you. You'd be flipping through looking like what happened today. Usually the nurse is there. You're asking them about recent recent medications, anything recent that happened. And what about the what about the time course of this? You know, if if this person's been here for less than twenty four hours versus if this person's been here for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, does that help you at all in your? Or does the time course of, or I should say, the time course of the hypoxia? Maybe that's a better way to ask. The time course of how quickly the hypoxia develops does that does that give you clues? I think there there can definitely be some clues there. I think you know there's a difference between acute hyperacute onset. You know, this came on in seconds or minutes from something that's come on more gradually over hours or even days, right? Those are, those fall into very different categories. We think about different things there. As for like how long this person has been in the hospital, there, there could be some clues there, you know, I mean, especially if there are things like coming out of the operating room or just admitted, like there could be some clues there. Um, I tend to think that probably the biggest clues are their history, like what are what are their medical conditions, and we should run through hers again. And two, um, what are their ins and outs? That's one of the first things. Vital signs and ins and outs are two of the things that I I always want to know when I go to a rapid response for hypoxia. Yeah, Cyrus, do we have vitals for her? Do you want to give some uh, hypothetical vitals and ins and outs for her so we can, you know, jump off from there? Yeah, so we'll say that she uh, is mildly tachycardic with a heart rate of 110. Her blood pressure is 170 over 115. Her pulse oximeter is 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 oscillating, uh, but generally in the mid 80s. She uh, is a febrile currently. Her respiratory rate is anywhere from 24 to 28. Sometimes getting a little bit higher than that. Um, and then in regards to her ins and outs, you know, you go back and you look through the chart. You talk to the nurse. It sounds like. She got several liters of resuscitation when she came in through the emergency department and then another couple liters and hasn't really urinated a whole lot. So she's maybe three to four liters positive, best you can tell. Okay, so so some really useful information there. Just to summarize, so she's tachycardic, tachypnic, afebrile, she's volume up, and her sats are in the 80s. One thing we should talk about is waveform. So a pulse ox is a number but ideally you're also looking at the screen and you should see a waveform. If you don't see a good waveform, if it doesn't look like a complex that matches the, the heartbeat, then you have to wonder, is it accurate? So, I mean, let's just assume that we have a better pulse ox in the room and we can actually see a waveform and we trust it because that changes our thinking a lot. It's always embarrassing when the, you find out the pulse ox isn't even attached. <laughs> Happened to me <laughs> yeah. more than one time. <laughs> I'm like, oh boy, they're hypoxic. Yeah, or it's like on their toe, and they're, yeah. I'm like, it's a weird waveform. I don't recognize this, and then I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's why it's like hanging at the side of the bed, swinging back and forth or something. Right. This is great stuff. So, reminding the audience about this patient because it was a while ago, we gave her her baseline. So she's it's a woman. 
six in her 60s. She's here with urinary tract source and she has sepsis. Uh, she has asthma, COPD, overlap, bronchiectasis. She's had some heart failure. Uh, ejection fraction is borderline and she has obesity. So, and then we've given you her vital signs and things and, you know, she's volume up. Uh, so, you know, we have a, I guess we probably have a pretty good sense of what's going on, but Nick, what do you think, like, what are steps that you think people should take? And, and please feel free to point out anything that you see people commonly do wrong as they're, you know, running into the room to assess a situation like this. So a couple of things. I mean, one is there are a lot of things that can cause hypoxemia. And so it's important to have a framework, avoid premature closure and fixating on a single cause. You know, just in this little clinical vignette we've heard, this patient has um, some respiratory disease, bronchiectasis, COPD, asthma. They have some cardiac disease. They've gotten a reasonable amount of fluid, which could be interacting with either of those. She also has an infection. She's been getting medications. There's a lot of things that could be going on. And one other thing that we should do is we should look at her med list, um, see if she's received any meds that could suppress her respiration. It doesn't seem like it based on our clinical exam, but that's always something we should look at along with the history and the incidents. Um, yeah. There's a lot of iatrogenic hypoxemia, um, either by putting people on meds or fluids or by taking them off oxygen that they were on at home. Um, those are embarrassing reasons to be hypoxemic, though easy to fix. So what about if, if you had to say, uh, so we've gone in the room, we're, we're examining the patient, um, the, we've, we've had done a whole show on shortness of breath workup, you know, kind of doing a hypothesis driven physical exam. Of course we do a cardiopulmonary exam here, you know, looking for signs of heart failure, ju- elevated, elevated JVP, displaced PMI, edema, that those sort of things, um, and, and of course you already told us work of breathing, like what tests are you going to order and what is, what's going to help you with your differential as you're getting into the room for, for this specific patient or, or for any patient? So I'm going to listen with my stethoscope, but it, it's not as useful as you might think. Breath sounds are somewhat notoriously un, unuseful in identifying the cause of hypoxemia. You know, there's things that could be a slam dunk. If we hear wheezing and she has a history of asthma, that could be helpful. If we hear obvious rawls everywhere, that could push us a little bit in one direction. If we heard more of like a focal bronchi and um, consolidation, that, that might tip us more towards an ammonia. But in general, breath sounds are probably not going to be the most useful piece of information. What I find very useful, if you have it available, is ultrasound. And which, so I think it is becoming more and more available. I know Paul and I are both involved in, uh, you know, working, working with ultrasound with trainees and learning our, still educating ourselves about this. It wasn't something we learned uh, until we became attending physicians just a couple of years ago. We started learning this during the show, actually. So what, is, what do you find useful um, for point of care ultrasound, like where we're just getting a quick idea of things? What should people think about doing? Right. So the point of point of care ultrasound is not to be a make believe sonographer. You're not you're not trying mm-hmm. to quantify the size of a gallstone or measure the EF with 12 decimal points. Your goal should be to answer straightforward clinical questions that you can confidently assess. So for example, I'm going to put the probe on and just make sure she's got bilateral lung sliding. Make sure she doesn't have evidence of pneumothorax. Um, I can also look at the general pattern of lines in the lung, look at a couple different lung fields and see if this is A lines, which is a sort of normal pattern, or B lines, which can suggest more of an alveolar filling process. The physics of why you get these different patterns, it's not important to understand, but B lines, those sort of vertical lines that go straight down from the pleura, right. that suggests that there's fluid in the in the periphery of the lung that's allowing sound waves to sort of conduct down farther. So when there's extra fluid in the alveolar space, it can, it can cause B lines. And that's not necessarily water. It could be blood. It could be pus. It could be protein. It could be lots of things. But when you see diffuse B lines, that's a very different story than if you see A lines. Mm-hmm. There's also some specific things we could see that might help us. Like if we see a big pleural effusion, a big low bar collapse, that could be very informative. And then we should also look at the heart and we can try to get a sense of like, is the systolic function grossly normal or not? You know, again, we're not trying to quantify things. 
but we can make big statements like, does the RV look like it's big? Is there evidence of pressure volume overload that might tip us off that there's a PE? Um, and is the LV systolic function normal or, or, or not normal? Maybe it looks significantly depressed. Those are the kind of things that we can, that, that can help us a lot and quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So basic, a, a lot of this is binary, right? Like yep. EF normal or not a fusion present or not, uh, you know, I, I think all these things, Paul, any, anything else or Cyrus, anything, any other things to add to the list that you find the ultrasound useful for? No, I was actually waiting to use the word binary and then you told right out of my mouth. Yeah. I, I, I love all that. <laughs> so like all these sort of yes, no questions that you can kind of answer, I think are exactly what focus is designed yeah. for. So I think it's perfect. Right. So making sure this person doesn't have tamponade, making sure this person doesn't have mm -hmm. evidence of RV strain, making sure this person doesn't have more decompensated heart failure. Those are big questions. And then depending on what you see, you might want to look elsewhere. So you might say, hmm, the RV is large and the, the tapsy looks not normal. I'm going to go look at the legs and see if I can find a DVT. Because if you find a DVT, yep. mm -hmm. that's going to change your management right there. Things like that. Anything more than that is probably the purview of a sonographer and a radiologist to make the call. And this is like kind of supplementing our physical exam, our data gathering. I'm often not basing like all my all my decisions on it, especially if it's like an IVC or JVP that I'm, I'm looking at with the ultrasound. I always sort of take that in context of everything else that's going on. Um, I, I know everyone wishes IVC was just like, oh, IVC, big or small, <laughs> give fluids or don't. But I, I, you know, I think it's more complicated than that. Yeah, the IVC is kind of notoriously unreliable. The IVC was initially sort of developed as, hey, look, we can measure a CVP without measuring, without putting in a line. Um, but it turns out that CVP isn't terribly useful, and so neither is IVC size. So what else? Uh, we, we've talked about, you know, gathering the history, sort of sizing our patient up. We, we talked about how we can use POCUS to supplement our physical exam and maybe get some clues what's going on. What other testing are you going to look at and um, for for this patient here and talk maybe considering blood gases, labs you might order, other other testing? So we should definitely get some blood work. Um, you know, I think the question of whether or not you need an ABG is a good one. Not everybody who's hypoxic needs an ABG. I mean, the ABG is giving you multiple pieces of information. It's giving you an oxygen, a PaO2, so how much oxygen is dissolved in the blood. It's giving you a hemoglobin saturation, and it's also letting you measure CO2. And so the best reason to get an ABG is because you need all of that information. If you've got a reliable pulse ox reading and this doesn't seem like somebody where you're worried about alveolar hypoventilation, maybe you could just do a VBG. So there's, you know, there's not, not everybody needs it, but I will say as somebody who has let people draw ABGs on me for practice, it is not as painful as people make it out to be, um, especially if they get it quickly. If they're poking around, it's not fun, but it's about the same as, as letting somebody practice an IV on you. This episode is brought to you by 10,000, an audience. Guess what? I wear 10,000 every day. I have four pairs of their interval shorts, which I love, and here's why. First of all, I love the way they look and feel and second of all, they're super functional. They have this no bounce pocket that zips up. I throw my cell phone in there. I can go for a run. I can go to the gym and my phone's not banging around causing injuries to me. You know what I'm talking about. I want you to try out 10,000 because they work with top strength and endurance athletes to co-design, test and develop their gear so you know it's heavily vetted before they show up at your door. Kit up now and get 10% off your purchase. Go to 10,000.cc slash curb. That's T-E-N-T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D dot C-C slash curb to get 10% off. They offer free shipping, free returns, and a lifetime guarantee. Get up off your butt and get the highest quality, best fitting, and most comfortable training shorts you've ever worn from 10,000. This episode is brought to you by Med Mastery. And audience, at this point, you've heard of Med Mastery. Med Mastery is the award-winning online learning platform that's been endorsed by the British Medical Association. And they offer lots of courses and things that are really useful to us in internal medicine. Things like 
how to how to read EKGs from the basics all the way up to the more advanced stuff. They even teach you about echocardiography, mechanical ventilation, pulmonary function testing. And guess what? They do this with amazing educators, people you've heard of, people you love, people like the great Dr. Joel Toff talking about fluids and electrolytes. And many residency programs around the world are using MedMastery to train their clinicians. So if you're an educator and need a group subscription for your team, then the friendly folks at MedMastery, they'd be happy to help you out. Listeners of this show can claim a discount on any of their subscriptions. Just go to www.medmastery.com slash curbsiders. Again, that's www.medmastery.com slash curbsiders. All right, Nick. So let's, we've, you, you made us examine the patient, which is fine. You know, I guess we should do that every once in a while. Um, <laughs> We should probably, I suppose, also maybe address our hypoxemia. So what's the next step for, for our patient here? So first of all, what, what initial intervention should we do? And then after we get her semi-stabilized, what are the next steps in our workup for her? So this is a situation where, you know, we're not waiting to get a diagnosis before we start treatment. We're going to start treatment for hypoxia right away because it's easy to treat hypoxemia by giving somebody supplemental oxygen. In a situation like this, you can start small. You can give them just conventional nasal cannula give them like six liters per minute of oxygen and see how they respond to that. If her sats go from the mid eighties to nineties on that, we can, you know, celebrate a little bit. We've, we've solved this problem and then we can take our time trying to figure out what this problem was that we just solved. On the other hand, let's say that her sats don't budge. Now we should put more oxygen on her, maybe a non rebreather mask, maybe another form of high flow or non-invasive positive pressure. And now we realize that she's sick right? She didn't get better with supplemental oxygen. And so there's an increased sense of urgency and there's likely implications for where she's going to go in the hospital. If she's needing a lot of oxygen to normalize her saturation, she probably needs to go to a higher level of care. So we can get information in about 30 seconds. We put a mask, we put a cannula on and we see what happens. I'll give one important little side note here, which is you should remember that the pulse ox is a time machine. You're looking at 30 seconds to go. Um, and the reason for this is that the blood leaving my heart right now is going to take about 30 seconds to get to my fingertip and even longer if I have reduced cardiac output and my blood flow is stagnant. So don't expect it to work right away. Um, it'll take, it'll take a little while from putting oxygen on somebody's face to see an improvement in their saturation. It's also something that I'm constantly reminding people when we intubate because somebody's sats will drop, you'll put the tube in and then, oh my God, their sats are continuing to drop. That's because the blood from their lungs is still on its way out to their finger. And the new oxygenated blood that's going through that breathing tube is going to take a little while to get there. So just remember that the pulse ox is a time machine and you can, you can be that calm person in the room when that happens. It's a little less if it's on your ear or your forehead, by the way. It's going to be more like 15 seconds then. <laughs> I, I, you know, I had not heard this before. I, I love that point. That, that's a great point about the 30 second delay. I would like to return to the different types of ventilation in a minute or oxygenation, oxygenating, ventilating patients in a minute. But as, so we're slapping oxygen on the person. Let's say the, her sats come up to a point we're comfortable with. They're 90, 90%. She's on six liters. How are you thinking through the differential as you're getting information back? Let's say we, you know, usually in a situation like this and feel free to add or subtract tests, but usually we're going to get like, you know, rainbow of tubes, metabolic panel, like this, let's assume this is a rapid response. Usually you're getting metabolic panels, you're getting uh, CBC, you're getting troponin. Usually there's an EKG, a chest X-ray, you get a portable chest X-ray. We talked about our, our POCUS exam. Um, maybe a lactate if, if we're worried for sepsis and uh, what else are you putting stock in and how are you generating your differential from the information? So there are a lot of things that can cause hypoxemia and I think we need a framework. And fortunately, there's a great one for this, the six causes of hypoxemic hypoxia. And so let's run through those one by one. The first one, low inspired oxygen. By the way, this is almost never the right answer unless you happen to be like on a mountaintop or in a place where some other gas is displacing oxygen. But we always say it first for some reason. So low inspired oxygen. Next up, we have alveolar hypoventilation. This is a situation where you're not bringing oxygen into your lungs. This can happen for two reasons. One is central. Your brain is not saying to breathe, like for example, because you received opioids or because you have obesity hypoventilation syndrome, or because you have a brainstem stroke. Um, but 
you're not you're not breathing. You're you won't breathe. The other cause of alveolar hypoventilation is peripheral. You can't breathe. This could be because you have neuromuscular weakness and you you just can't move your respiratory muscles enough. It could be because you have um, paralysis and you can't get the signal to those muscles. Or it could be because there's a problem in your lungs, like you have really bad airflow obstruction from COPD, for example, or asthma, and you just can't move the air because there's so much resistance in those areas. The key thing about alveolar hypoventilation is this will affect getting oxygen into your lungs and getting CO2 out of your lungs. So that if we get an ABG or a VBG in this person, we would expect to see both hypoxemia and hypercarbia. That's one of the hallmarks. Moving on to the next category, VQ mismatch. So VQ mismatch is when the delicate balance in your lung between where the air is going and where the blood flow is going is perturbed. Our lungs are really smart. They're really good at sending blood to the places where there is oxygen. You have something called hypoxic vasoconstriction, which is where the blood vessels constrict if there's an alveoli that's not well ventilated. One clinical pearl I'll throw in here is normally your lungs are really smart. There are times when we iatrogenically make your lungs less smart. And this is actually a very common cause of hypoxia to a pulmonary consult. So you have somebody who's got a large pleural effusion, they've got atelectasis, and they're suddenly hypoxic. And you look at the chart and you can see they were started on a calcium channel blocker or nitrate. Medications like that will impair hypoxic vasoconstriction and it will cause blood to go through that area that isn't ventilated. So this is, you know, if you, if you do a pulmonary fellowship, you will get this consult at least once a month and you will, you will look really smart by coming up with this answer. But just remember that certain meds impair hypoxic vasoconstriction and will cause VQ mismatch or, or even shunt at the extreme. And does that usually happen acutely where someone's coming in with like a, some sort of alveolar issue, filling process or atelectasis, and then they get newly started on those medicines or is it, can it happen in either order where they... They're on those medicines and then... The most common situation where I've seen this, you know, probably a dozen plus times is somebody who's got a um, heart failure, they have large bilateral pleural effusions, they're getting diuresed, but they still have these big effusions and then they get started on some afterload reduction. So they get put on nitrates or calcium channel blocker for rate control and then suddenly they're hypoxic. Okay, got it. And so that's our fault. We put them on meds that made their lung less smart, and now they're having shunt physiology. They're having blood go through part of the lung that is not well, uh, not well ventilated because it's you know this collapsed piece of lung that's sitting in a big effusion, for example. Okay, so that was cause number three, VQ mismatch. Um, and I, I kind of leaned a little bit into shunt there, and we should talk about the difference between VQ mismatch and shunt because people are, are often wondering, well, what's the difference? So Yeah, and how do you tell? Yeah. So there's a really critical difference, which is um, what happens when you give them supplemental oxygen. If the problem is, is that they have part of the lung that's not getting as much ventilation as it should, and you give them a lot of oxygen, that will be enough to correct it. If the problem is they have a part of the lung that's getting absolutely no ventilation and blood is going by unventilated alveoli, um, that will not get better. And so VQ mismatch normalizes with supplemental oxygen. Shunt does not. And that's a super useful way to differentiate them. So that's the fourth one. What are the other two, two causes? So the other two, the last, the last two, one is diffusion limitation. So people often go looking for this one, but this is rarely the cause of hypoxia or hypoxemia in somebody at rest. And the reason is, is that, so what's going on with diffusion limitation? Your alveoli to capillary membrane is really, really skinny, and it's really efficient at exchanging oxygen. And so a red blood cell spends about a second going past each alveolus. And during that one second, it only needs about a quarter of a second to get fully oxygenated. And so even if your alveolar uh, capillary membrane is thickened and diffusion is impaired, there's still enough time for that red blood cell to get fully oxygenated. The time when people with diffusion limitation get hypoxic is when their cardiac output is elevated and the blood is going by faster is then it doesn't have enough time to do it. So people with diffusion limitation from processes like pulmonary fibrosis or edema or inflammation 
tend to not have resting hypoxia. They'll have sort of a sort of normal sat at rest, but they desat with exercise. So these are the people where you see them in clinic and then you put a pulse ox on them and you walk them around the clinic and they desat then. That's more of the sort of illness script for a diffusion limitation picture. Mm-hmm. So in the acute, the, in, a, in a rapid response where someone's just sitting in bed at rest, it's it's less of a, maybe one small factor, but less of- It could be contributing. Um, you know, somebody somebody lying in bed, their cardiac output could be elevated. They could be using a lot of oxygen to breathe. They could be using a lot of accessory muscles. So it's not mm-hmm. impossible, but it's rarely the cause. Okay. And then the last one, which is not a common cause, but you will see it occasionally- is somebody with a low mixed venous oxygen. What that means is that they are extracting so much oxygen in the periphery that the blood coming back to the lungs is so desaturated that it can't get fully oxygenated again. And you see this in a couple of states. You can see this with really bad anemia where they their oxygen carrying capacity is so low that their tissues are taking most of the oxygen. In, in all of us, our saturation in our fingertip is about 95%, 100%. And our saturation of the blood going into our lungs is about 70 or 75%. So our lungs can bring it up that 30% or so. But if our tissues have extracted so much and the blood coming back to the heart has a sat of 40 or 50%, uh, it may not get all the way back up. So they may desaturate. The other place where you see this is people who have really, really bad cardiac output. And so, for example, you might see somebody who you're called to the bedside about severe bradycardia and they desaturate. They're bradycardic for a minute or two and then they desat. That's probably because the blood flow is so sluggish that their tissues are taking all that oxygen and their lungs can't bring it back up again. Let me recap these. And then I want you to tell us like, how are we going to apply this to our patient or how are we going to apply this, you know, when we're walking into the room? So low inspired O2, you said usually not applicable because we're not practicing medicine at altitude, but if you are, think of that one. Alveolar hypoventilation, which can be central or peripheral, and that's usually high CO2, low O2. A VQ mismatch, which will get better when we apply oxygen to the patient versus a shunt, which will often not get better when you apply oxygen to the patient. Diffusion limitation is usually not an issue at rest unless someone has really high cardiac output at rest for for some reason. And then the last one was low mix venous O2, where they're just extracting so much oxygen from the blood for various reasons, like severe anemia, that uh, they just can't reoxygenate it fully. So those were the six. So with our patient here, I mean, we've given you this story of a woman, she's got baseline lung disease, heart disease. She's here with sepsis. Uh, how are you, what, what do you think from this framework? Uh, you know, how do you apply this in real time? Well, so we know that her saturation got better, so it's probably not shunt. So we've crossed one off the list. But one really useful thing that we can do if we have a blood gas is we can calculate an AA gradient or what I like to call an AA difference. So what is an AA difference? Um, the, the first A, the big A, is the alveolar oxygen content. The second A, the little A, is the arterial oxygen content. And so an AA difference is measuring the difference between oxygen in your alveoli and in your blood. And so there's a formula for this. You can go on MDCalc, you can plug it in. We don't need to go over what the formula is or how it's derived. But the key thing to understand is that in situations where you are not getting oxygen into your alveoli, so low inspired oxygen or alveolar hypoventilation, you will have a normal AA difference. The problem isn't getting the oxygen in. The problem is you're not breathing it in. It isn't there. So normal AA difference suggests low inspired oxygen or alveolar hypoventilation. All the other causes have a increased AA difference. Great. Which would be, so the VQ mismatch, the shunt, the diffusion limitation, the low mix venous O2, those are going to have this increased AA difference. Those Correct. are the, yeah. Great. So so for our patient, Cyrus, do we have a do we have an ABG on on this patient to calculate an AA difference? Or I mean, what's what is a normal AA difference? Cyrus, do we have do we have that in, built in here? In this patient, we didn't uh, we didn't get a blood gas, but we can certainly say okay because um, they kind of corrected once we gave them oxygen, so that sort of kind of oh, obviated yeah, so can, the need. Um, yeah, so I exactly. think that's so, I think that's useful. 
Yeah, exactly. So you don't need you don't need an ABG and you don't need an AA difference in everybody. It can be useful if you're struggling to put them into one of these categories. Um, I think at a very high level, just remember that if it's a normal AA difference, it's alveolar. It's it's a problem getting air into the lungs, either because there isn't enough air in the environment or they're not breathing, and everything else will have an increased an increased difference. And then if they're not getting it into their lungs, they'll also have a high CO two, and that's something you could detect on a VBG, for example. And I think to answer your question, Matt, normals typically, I want to say five to 10, but there's some variation, um, I believe as patients age, uh, particularly, you know, very, very advanced age, uh, age patients, you can have an, a, a bigger gradient that's not necessarily pathologic. Yeah. Okay. So that's there's right. some sort exactly. of correction. So there's a formula, age plus 10 over four is your normal A difference, but, but as a general rule, in younger people, it's it's maybe about ten, and older people, it might be like more like twenty. Um, if it's more than that, it's clearly abnormal. Cyrus, can you? We were just talking. We were just talking offline in a little timeout. Peek behind the curtain for the audience. Sometimes we take timeouts to plan uh, what we're going to go through with the rest of our time. But Cyrus, you want to bring us back into this? I, I thought the the kind of the question, the point you were bringing up, you you're you're just finishing. You just finished pulmonary fellowship and. Uh, what do you wish you would have known earlier and what, yeah. do, what do you want to lead the audience through here? Absolutely. So, I mean, I think in this case, you know, we've got a pretty good story for volume overload and uh, generally speaking, a, a cornerstone of therapy for volume overload is going to be diuresis. So that's, that's not particularly exciting, I suppose, but really to get to, to your question, Matt, you know, the other side of that coin is treating with supplemental oxygen because that diuretic is not going to work instantaneously. And so, I've learned from nurses, respiratory therapists, other fellows, just over the course of training, what the different oxygen modalities are and why we use what we use. And I think that that's an important lesson that everyone could either learn or use a refresher on. And and perhaps, you know, mid-summer when everyone's sort of like getting back into the swing of things is a great time to do it. So, so Nick, why don't you maybe take us through the different options for oxygenation from kind of like the, the, the lowest, uh, the, the least intense intervention all the way up to the, the, the most, uh, the most aggressive intervention. Yeah, this is, this is an absolutely foundational thing, which is not taught in medical school. And it's kind of baffling to me. This is something that the best way to learn this is to get a respiratory therapist to show you all these devices and tell them, tell you about them, or better yet, try on some of these devices. Because if you can do that, it's actually very illuminating to feel what non-invasive positive pressure feels like. But let's, let's, start at, let's start at the least invasive, simplest. So a nasal cannula. So these are those two little prongs that go in your nose. It's connected to either the wall or a tank. And it typically delivers between one and six liters per minute. And that usually gives you, you know, about 3% additional FiO2 per liter. So maybe up to about 45%. You know, this is not a lot of oxygen, but for people who have VQ mismatch, this can be enough to help them get the rest of the way up. There are better forms of nasal, nasal cannula. So there's some you might see that have a little thing that looks like a mustache, a little reservoir. And that just means that when the person breathes in, they get a little bit more air uh, through, they get a little more oxygen and a little bit less ambient air. Moving up still further, you can have uh, what's called a simple mask or a venti mask which is a mask that goes over your face. It doesn't have a bag on it and it's blowing oxygen at typically about 10 liters per minute. So this can maybe get you into the forties or 50% FiO2 range. It's important to remember that this is very imprecise because the person is breathing a mixture of oxygen and air. And it kind of depends like how much is coming from where. So you don't know for sure, but the approximately 40 to 50%. That's super important because it's, again, it's one of those silly things, but that ox- that air that is coming through that nasal cannula is 100% oxygen. Right, right, exactly. So you're getting a mixture of 100% and 21%. And the value that you get kind of depends on how much you're pulling from the environment and how much is going through your nose. And so the venti mask, that thing that can click around on it, uh, can control a little bit like how much of that uh, room air is pulling in with that the air coming through the nasal, the um, the mask. Exactly. So you can dial it in. The issue is, is that it's not perfectly tight fitting on your face. So it's not perfectly accurate either. It's approximate. The next step is the non rebreather mask. And this is that mask that has a bag on it. And in order for it to function as a non rebreather, that bag has to be inflated. And the idea here is, is that just like that little mustache reservoir nasal cannula, 
Now you have a big reservoir so that you can take a full breath and get hopefully 100% oxygen. The issue is, is that that bag doesn't really hold that much air. It doesn't hold like liters of air. So if you take a deep breath, you're going to drain that bag and then pull in air from the environment. So even a non-rebreather is not really 100%. These are the ones that are quick and easy to do uh, on the on the medical wards. Now we get to the slightly more advanced interventions. So high flow nasal cannula. You can recognize these. They're also called heated high flow nasal cannula. These are ones where there's a unit um, usually on a little stand that's plugged into oxygen, which is a green tube, and air, which is a yellow tube, and it has a mixer. So you can choose on there what FiO2 you want. It also has a flow rate, which is much higher, typically like 10 to 60 liters per minute. And this is tubing that goes from that mixer through a little heater humidifier and then up to your nose. And it's usually bigger prongs that have a band around your head that hold them securely on. And this can provide substantially higher flow, substantially higher FiO2. And there are great reasons to love high flow nasal cannula. There was a study called the Florali study, which showed that people who got this for hypoxemic respiratory failure had a lower chance of being intubated and lower mortality. So in people with pure hypoxic respiratory failure, this is a good choice. Another good choice is non-invasive positive pressure. And this comes in a couple different flavors. There's different types of machines, there's different settings, and there's different interfaces. Interface means the thing that goes on your face. So this could be a little thing that goes over your nose. It could be a mask that goes over your nose and mouth. It could be a big mask that goes over your whole face. Or they even have helmets where you look like an Apollo astronaut where it, your whole head is in this. That's the interface. I want to try Then the you helmet. have no, the helmet. Yeah, I want to try it out. I'm saying, yeah, I just uh, I, I have. They're actually pretty comfortable. It looks great, and I didn't. I did not find BiPAP with a mask very comfortable. <laughs> so when you have this thing on, whatever interface it is, you can hook it up to a machine, and you can do one of two things: you can either give continuous positive pressure, or you can give a positive pressure that's changing as you breathe. And positive pressure that's changing as you breathe is often called BiPAP. That's a brand name, but the idea is. If you just have positive pressure, that's going to keep your airways open, and that's going to improve oxygenation in certain states. So for example, if you have obstructive sleep apnea, positive pressure keeps your trachea open, your, your, keeps your tongue from falling back and blocking your airway. If you have heart failure and you have lots of fluid in the alveoli, right? what's happening is those alveoli are popping open and closed. That's what causes rawls when you listen to the person. You're hearing alveoli opening and closing. And so if you give that person positive pressure, it'll stent those alveoli open. So now they're no longer collapsing. And that will improve gas exchange. Sometimes you want to give positive pressure and help them breathe. So for example, if their work of breathing is really high or if they have uh, really high CO2, you want to help them blow some of it off. And that's when you would use um, ventilation. So that's when you would use BiPAP. And there you're essentially setting two pressures. One is CPAP and the other is the pressure that gets triggered with each breath. And here, like back to, we talked about protecting the airway before Paul's, Paul's great question about what exactly that means. I was, I, I was too afraid to ask that, Paul, but I always wondered the same thing. So I'm, yeah, I'm never afraid to look stupid. Uh, so we know it when we see it, Let, let's say we, we know it when we see it, but if someone's not protecting their airway, this non-invasive ventilation, usually off the table in my understanding, but is that, is that in your practice? It, it's an absolute contraindication. The okay. concern is that if you put a mask on somebody, a tight fitting mask, and they were to vomit and they couldn't take the mask off, they would aspirate and that could be catastrophic. So somebody who's on non-invasive needs to be awake and able to take it off or they need to have somebody right there with them. This is absolutely not a situation to just ignore them. Right. So four point restraints, not the person that you're reaching for BiPAP for is what I'm hearing. Nope. Great. (laughs) Yes. have seen it uh, in the morning when I've come in, uh, a patient strapped down with the bi-level on and I'm like, guys, what what are we doing just, here? Just put the words your honor at the end of that <laughs> sentence. Like try that on for size. Yeah. Uh, look, Cashlack, Cyrus, we're still training up some staff at Cashlack. It's it's not a perfect institution, but you know, uh, you still know, yeah. uh please people, it's uh it's application season is coming up. We'd love your ERAS applications. Keep looking for us no, on ERAS. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Cash lack, not a real place. What, what else? 
Well, so, so how do you choose between all these things? So now we have a table full of devices. Which one do we want to put on Miss Wilson? So in general, start small. We'll try the nasal cannula. Did that work? Maybe that improved her oxygen, but her work of breathing is still high. We think she's volume overloaded. She seems like somebody who might benefit from positive pressure. And so there's kind of two ways we could do that. We could do high flow nasal cannula, which provides a little bit of positive pressure. Um, or we could try um, non-invasive positive pressure, but mask on her and, and hook, up, hook her up to a machine. Both are good options in this case. If she's awake and comfortable, non-invasive positive pressure might be the way to go. This is a good situation for it, by the way, because when I think about non-invasive, I think about it as being really great in people who have a quickly reversible cause of hypoxia. So for example, you know, somebody with COPD where you've given them antibiotics, you've given them steroids, they're just going to get through like eight or 12 hours and then they're going to start to feel better. That's a good situation for it. Similarly, somebody with um, decompensated heart failure where you, you gave them the Lasix, you know, you stopped the maintenance fluids that should never have been started in the first <laughs> place and she's going to get better. She just needs a little bit of time. And by the way, the Lasix you don't have to pee for Lasix to help, right? So a common misconception about Lasix is that it's only beneficial because it's a diuretic. It's also a venodilator. So it's going to increase your capacitance for blood and pull some of that fluid out of her lungs. So you should actually see benefit within about five minutes in many cases. So if we put a mask on her, we put her on a little bit of CPAP and we um, give her some Lasix, we have to keep reassessing her and see how she's doing. But it's not uncommon to see that somebody treated like that will get better in, you know, 20, 30 minutes. They'll be looking better. Should we mention sitting the patient up as we're sort of talking about practical tips? I feel like that's something that we forget about all the time, especially oh, in this. I was going to add that. I was going to add yeah. that too. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So position is really important, right? When you're, when you're lying down, your diaphragm is at a big disadvantage. Your organs push up. Your diaphragm mechanically can't work as well. If you're sitting up or, or, not that not patients usually stand up, but if you sit them up more, it's mechanically easier to breathe. You know, just think about like what somebody who's short of breath looks like. They're often kind of leaning forward, tripoding, right? And what they're doing is they're getting themselves in a position where they can really engage their accessory muscles, like their sternocleidomastoids, their intercostals, and all of their abdominal organs are moved down by gravity. So they can they can breathe better like that. So you know, often just changing the angle of the bed can can help the patient. It, 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 two comments on that. Number one, I was telling Paul uh, that my first night of residency was on night float. And I remember going to a, the room of a patient with hypoxemia. And I basically was like, I called my senior and I was like, hey, the patient's sats are low. He's like, did you sit them up? I'm like, no. He goes, did you put them on oxygen? I'm like, no. And he's like, okay, put them on oxygen, <laughs> turn it to six liters and sit them up in bed and I'll be right there. And then we did all these things we've been talking about. And the other comment is, if you walk into a room and someone's tripoding, uh, that would qualify as sick in my sick versus not sick book. Yeah. Uh, it's Absolutely. usually not a good sign. <laughs> yeah, that person is, is that, that's a workout, right? They're using a lot of muscles. They're not going to be able to sustain that for very long. And when they tire out, they're going to be in a, in, in a lot of danger. So if you see somebody tripoding in the hospital, that's a true emergency. So we've gone through a ton tonight. I, I did want to make sure that we talk about just like pitfalls. So in these rapid response situations where you have the patient, you know, uh, there's lots of stuff going on. Nick, anything and Cyrus, feel free to add in as well. But any any big pitfalls or common mistakes that you see people make that you you want to prevent our audience from making? Let's talk about ABGs and their and their limitations for a second. So an ABG, you know, somebody puts a needle into an artery, draws a sample of blood, and then you analyze it. There's a couple of ways where you can have problems. So first of all, did you really put it into an artery? You can have either a venous sample or a mixture. And if you've ever used ultrasound to look at somebody's radial artery, if you put the probe on really gently, you'll notice something interesting, which is you'll see the radial artery as a circle, and you'll see these two little Mickey Mouse ears on the side. Those are veins. And so often what happens is somebody pokes, they get a little bit of blood, the blood flow stops, and then they move the needle a little bit and they get a little more blood. What's probably just happened there is they've poked a Mickey Mouse ear and a Mickey Mouse head. And what they have in the syringe is a mixture of venous and arterial blood. So if the blood does not come out quickly, it may not be a reliable sample. That's point number one. Point number two is 
you fill the syringe up with blood, right? And then what? Well, there's a special cap you're supposed to put on so you can get all the air out. If you don't get the air out, what's going to happen is that little air bubble is going to transfer oxygen into the blood and you'll get spurious high numbers. If there's froth there, if there's a lot of bubbles, that sample is worthless, right? Because there's so much surface area, you're basically oxygening their blood in the tube. So don't trust that sample. There's a couple other things to know. So assuming you you are analyzing at point of care, so you hand it to like a stat nurse and they run it right there and you get results two minutes later, that's a really good sample. But if you send it off to a central lab and it like sits around for a while, it can be it can be falsely high if there's a bubble, or it can also be falsely low. And there's one really good situation where you'll see this, which is the person with a super high white count. But he's got like a white count over 100,000. You draw blood gas on them and it's going to have a really terrifyingly low PaO2. That's not real. What's happened is something called leukocyte larceny. Those white blood cells in the sample have been using up oxygen when you took it out of them. So don't trust that. The last point is look at all the numbers on the blood gas. The blood gas is telling you more than your pH, PaO2, CO2, and bicarb. It's telling you a lot of other stuff. So look at the met hemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin. It's really embarrassing if somebody has a high met hemoglobin and that's why their SATs are in the 80s and they're not getting better and you draw the blood gas and you don't look at that number. So make sure you scan all the way down when you do it. Well, we have covered so much. I know, of course, I'm sure the audience can think of other questions they've had. Nick, you're on you're on social media. People can ask you questions. Did you want to plug any of the the work that you do? I, I know people you have you have a big following. People are huge fans of the one sheets that you make. But where can they find your stuff? Yeah, so there's a website, onepageericu.com, uh, where you can find one page summaries of a lot of critical care topics. So for example, there's a one pager on hypoxia and hypoxemia. There's a one pager on nasal oxygen delivery that'll tell you more about high flow cannula. There's a one pager on the pulse ox. There's a one pager on non-invasive positive pressure. So pretty much all of the topics that we've talked about tonight, you can you can you know learn more about there. Yeah, and we you know uh, we we didn't talk about COVID nineteen on this one. We did a previous episode on ventilating patients in COVID nineteen. So that's another resource people can check out. They can check out our episode on you know the physical exam for shortness of breath. Uh, if, if you want to talk, of course, we have Curbsiders episodes on tons of stuff, um, but this is this this has been so great, Nick. Thank you so much for all your teaching tonight and thank your family for allowing you to uh, spend spend the evening with us instead of with them. And just um, for leukocyte larceny, too, by the way, like I just I will take that and cherish it for the rest of my days. That's just such a great <laughs> name. <laughs> it's a great name, right? <laughs> yeah. It'd be a good band, actually. OK, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. And post-hardcore math rock, I'm thinking. That that sounds right. <laughs> the opening act for Subclavian Steel. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. All righty. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com. And while you're there, sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Plus, twice each month, you'll get our Curbsiders Digest, recapping the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high-value, practice-changing knowledge. So we want your feedback. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. You can also email us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. Reminder that this and most episodes are available for free CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. I wanted to give a special thanks to our writer for this episode, Dr. Eddie Jang, as well as to our producer for this episode, Cyrus Askin, and to our whole team. The Curbsiders is produced and edited by the team at Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media, and Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And with all that, Paul, until next time... I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And I've been Dr. Cyrus Askin. And as always, our main Dr. Paul Nelson Williams, thank you and goodbye.